Okay, so we just wrapped up talking about AIDS, okay, and the different treatments for AIDS. So now we are on other viral diseases, okay? So we'll talk about why influenza requires a new vaccine. It's not just for mutation. There's actually another reason why influenza um, has to have a new vaccine each year. And then talk about some emergent viruses and maybe possibly their origin. So I think I have a little bit more information on like COVID in this one. What do you mean? Like the COVID stuff? Yes. Yeah. I just, because it's relevant, so. Even though we're kind of sick of it, aren't we? Okay. Just a little. Wait, we're talking about? 27.4. Okay. So influenza, smallpox, hepatitis, yellow fever, polio, AIDS, SARS, these are all um, types of viruses. Okay. Put a little flow chart here. Colds and flus can be caused by viruses, rabies, mumps, measles, chickenpox, polio, warts. Um, so yeah, they're all viral diseases. They can cause disease. I'll talk about how some viruses has, have actually been um, associated with cancer. And another reason why we should study viruses is that there are viruses that affect plants. So we have major losses in agricultural and forestry, especially with trees. Um, and then viruses can, affect the productivity of, of our natural ecosystem. So it's important to study viruses. So the first virus I want to talk about in depth is the influenza virus. Okay, the flu is caused by influenza. Influenza has different types and subtypes. You'll notice that they have names like H1N1 or H3N2, and that has everything to do with these two types of proteins that um, are like rods and spikes on the outside. And it's like the ratio of those rods. They're also distinguished by their capsid protein. So type A is the epidemic one that can be transferred among humans and birds. Type B and C are strictly to humans and actually rarely cause any serious health problems. So A is the, you know, the big one you gotta worry about. But the strands have everything to do with these protein spikes, the H and the N, H, the hemagglutin in, and the N is the neuraminidase. So the H, its main job is to get access inside of that host cell, and then the N is to help it bust out. And there are mutations that occur, um, and thus change in that ratio of, of the hemagglutin gluten into the neuraminidase. Um, so, yeah. Serious? Yes, serious. Whoops. Maybe. Actually, I'm not sure. But it. Just know it's not. Not as bad as A, I guess. Okay, so influenza can mutate, but what is really going on with the different um, vaccines is recombination. Okay, so the greatest problem in fight and flu 
is recombination. And how recombination occurs when you have viral RNA segments from two different subtypes that are in the same cell. And this makes it harder to fight. They're unrecognizable by antibodies from past infections, and they can be recombined, kind of like mixed and mashed together. So two different RNA segments in the same host cell. Recombination has been responsible for three major flu pandemics, Spanish flu, Asian flu, and the Hong Kong flu. Uh, where was I going to go with this? Yeah, okay, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. A lot of times these new strands do originate in the far east, and that's because of how close humans live to animals, like ducks, chickens, and hogs. So in the avian flu of 1997, it was H5N1 and it was transmitted between birds and birds migrate. Um, the mortality rate of avian flu was, uh, if I remember, really, really high, but the transmission was low because it can only spread from birds to humans and it didn't go from human to human. So the only way you got avian flu was from being around birds. Um, I'm gonna throw in H1N1 back in 2009, which was the swine flu. And it occurred in Mexico, um, I think it was Veracruz, Mexico. In 2009, I remember, I mean, I got, I'm pretty sure I came down with it in college. Campuses shut down, finals were thrown out the window. Um, yeah, but campuses were only shut down for like a couple of weeks. It was, it happened late spring. So I just remember there was no finals because kids were sick and they couldn't come in and take the finals. So it's like finals were like forgiven that year. They were just thrown out the window. So I was like, sweet. <laughs> Yeah, but the infection rate of swine flu um, was very similar to previous pandemics, but the mortality rate of it was not high. I think it was only 1.5%. And the weird thing about the swine flu, and which is why college campuses kind of across the nation shut down, was that it spread faster among young people than it did old people. So it affected young, more younger people, okay? And for whatever reason, I'm not exactly sure. Um, the Spanish flu, like I said, killed a lot of people, like more people than World War II. Um, the thing about what, I should say that the Spanish flu was called um, like the mother of all pandemics at the time because they couldn't isolate the strand. Um, they couldn't isolate it. They, they had a hard time pinpointing what was causing influenza. It was like almost like mysterious, if you will. And we just didn't really have the technology um, to figure out what was actually like causing it and where it cropped up. There's a book about the Spanish flu, um, and it's actually pretty good. With the Spanish flu, it kind of talks about like the like the first case in, in the United States actually happened in like Kansas at a military base, and then like just kind of how it spread out. And I don't know, it's it's actually a really really good book. So, what about black plague? The black plague um, was also caused by a virus, and it was spread among rats. Okay. Wait, so what is like the H for N1 thing again? H is that hemagglutinin, and then the N is that neuromedesis. Uh, the ratio of those H spikes to the N rods. Oh. Yep. So I have a table here, basis of comparison to the H1N1 pandemic and the swine flu. So you can see that we had they had a hard time isolating it back in 1918. Um, that it was highly spreadable, highly pathogenic, where here it was not so much, um, like didn't cause a lot of death, but here it caused a lot of death. And then they just talked about, cause like both of these are H1N1. And so this one was like way more deadly than I guess than the, the swine flu. So, and then you can see here that we did develop a vaccine within six months of detection, so. Okay, moving on to emergent viruses. So an emergent virus is just a virus that affects one organism and then it makes a jump to a different organism and causes disease. And so HIV would be considered an emergent virus because it occurred in simians and then made the jump to humans. And so it has expanded its host range. 
So I mean, I think I'm. I think I have three examples, three or four examples of emergent viruses. I thought I had a link I was going to show you about COVID. Maybe I'll find it later. Like part of the reason why we haven't been able to like figure out the origin of COVID has to do a lot with um, like security issues in China. Obviously, China is a little bit more restrictive with information. When avian flu came out, people spoke up against the government, like to reporters, and then the reporters kind of like did the dog work and traced it back to how it happened. So like, I mean, news reporters were actually like figuring out oh, hey, it happened here, and then you, and then they were just following breadcrumbs and then they actually figured out like how avian flu occurred. Where with um, COVID, um, if you speak out, there's like more retaliation uh, against that person as well as like their families and friends. And so people are scared to, to speak up. I just like read an article about it. So that's why everyone's, we just have not found the origin of COVID. I've heard that. So. A bunch of rumors that, like, ate a bat or something. Yeah, well, I, to tell you the truth, okay, so when do you guys think COVID hit the United States? In November. Yeah, November. November. Okay, good. So you guys are up to date because, like, there are some people that think it didn't happen until after January. But Red Blood, um, the Red, Red Cross was analyzing, analyzing blood samples, and they're like, no, <coughs> it was here a lot earlier than you think. So, we just didn't know what it was. Yep. Sorry. All right, so one type of emergent virus was called the hantavirus, a very deadly pneumonia that occurred in southwestern United States back in 93, and it's also known as the sin nombre or no name virus. They traced this virus to deer mice. And they just realized that there that it was being transmitted from deer mice to humans through fecal and urine contaminants. So these people, um, you know, they maybe didn't live in the greatest of conditions, or that it was air populations of humans where like the infestation of deer mice was high. So then what they did is they took out the deer mice, and then the disease rate went down. All right, another emergent virus is Ebola. Or hemorrhagic fever. The natural host of this is unknown, but you can see they have a couple uh, hypotheses in this diagram. They think it's bats. But the reason why Ebola is like really, really dangerous is that the lethal rate can exceed 50%. So you remember a few years ago, back in 2014, Ebola struck Africa and it was high death rates, but very few people, like less than, I think, 10,000 or 15,000 people were infected. But it was very spreadable. I mean, people went into Ebola um, high zones, but they were like dressed to the nines. I mean, they had goggles and masks and basically those biohazard suits because it was highly transmissible. So yeah, it's a close contact with blood. And here these people are like hemorrhaging, so blood is spewing out of them. So, I mean, it was very, um, yeah, high rates of infection. Okay, a third type, SARS, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Pneumonia-like symptoms, fatal in about 8% of cases the nice thing about SARS was that the rates of mutation were low, so they were able to get a vaccine um, and treat it, and SARS isn't really that big of an issue anymore. So. Yeah. 
you can see it's very similar to COVID. Um, it's not COVID, but it's kind of, I would say they're kind of in the same family of, of viruses. That picture of the groom and bride, I still like, I put that there because I remember when I was, I think I was in high school or, or my early years of college, just like reading the newspaper and I'm just like, gosh, could you imagine? Like they were masked. They did not take off their masks. They did not want to, they were terrified of SARS. Um, and it was very frequent in Asia. And that's kind of where like everyone started wearing face, face masks because of SARS. SARS was kind of the kickoff point for that. So. When I was in Norway, there were a lot of like Asian tourists there and they were all wearing masks. Yeah. Okay, the final slide on viral um, diseases. Viruses can cause cancer. We see a link between hepatitis B and liver cancer. We see a link between HPV, the human papillo, um, papilloma viruses, and cervical cancer. And so they're thinking, they, they're estimating that maybe um, viruses contribute at least to 15% of all human cancer worldwide. And the reason for that is viruses, you know, when they infect cells, they can alter the growth properties of those cells. They can interfere with the regulation of oncogenes um, and how they're expressed. And when you mess around with the oncogenes, then they become you know, proto-oncogenes and um, don't work right and tumors can form. Okay, review questions. Influenza subtypes differ in their, yes, A, protein spikes. Two, which of the following is not a viral disease? Nope, we t nope, mumps is a viral disease. I'm not super sure what Ebola or the 50-50 Okay, so you've narrowed it down to 50-50. It's either D or E. Is it E? It is E, diphtheria. Oh, I believe it's a bacteria, bacterial infection. An example of an emergent virus is E, Ebola, E for Ebola. All right, final section, um, uh, pre, oh my God, purons and viroids, subviral particles. So like parts of viral, parts of viral particles, wow. So I'll talk about what a prion is, what it is, um, how it can be trans transferred, and uh, what kind of diseases they cause. So prions kind of came into the picture because scientists noticed that there was a group of brain diseases that could be passed on um, before it was like detected. And when they analyzed the brains of these people that died, they noticed that it was very, very spongy. So here's what a normal brain looks like. And over here, you can see that there's, it just, there's more holes in it. And there's these small little cavities where these neurons died and just kind of looked spongy. And they're like, what's going on here? So they called these groups of diseases transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, or TSEs for short. So some examples, and some of these will um, sound familiar to you, of TSEs, um, scrapies, which occurs in sheep, bovine, spongiform, encephalopathy, BSC, or mad cow disease, chronic wasting in elk and deer, kuru, and my personal favorite, uh, just because it's in an X-File episode, um, Kreutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Now, Kuru is common in New Guinea, and the reason for that is there's a religion in New Guinea that practices cannibalism. So if a person is infected with TSC and they die, well, the people ate the body, and thus that disease was passed on. Um, for mad cow disease, I remember when I was in, it was either in first or third grade, um, one of those two grades, I don't know why I have that associated, but mad cow disease erupted in England. And so cows that had the disease um, would die, and then the farmers would ground up that tissue and add it to bone meal, and they fed it to other cows. 
<laughs> so then those cows would develop that cow disease. And to make it worse, not only that, those cows were slaughtered for human consumption and were passed on to humans. <laughs> and so when mad cow disease took place, everyone was really scared of beef. <laughs> So you can see that it's spread through infection of an infected brain into the recipients, tissue implants, or food. Right. So they're like, okay, so what's, what's causing these TSCs? What's causing this spongy brain uh, to develop? Well, the answer was tied to a subviral particle called a prion. Okay, so prion. Um, and back in the 1960s, they were trying to, you know, pass TSCs into like controlled experiments to figure out how it was spread. But they noticed that these TSEs would still remain infectious after they were exposed to radiation and to other harmful chemicals that destroy DNA and RNA. So it ruled out that TSEs were caused by nucleic acids. So it had to be a protein. So prion stands for protonaceous infectious particle. And what they found was that this prion, which kind of looks like the chevron down here, um, is a misfolded protein. And what it does is as soon as it kind of interacts with the normal protein, it causes that normal protein to misfold and do the same. And then they go on and infect other original or normal proteins. And so pretty soon all these proteins are misfolded and it causes a chain-like reaction um, and those proteins don't work right, and thus that spongy brain develops. And I guess it's very, you know, kind of localized. Maybe it's very tissue tropism, if you will, very specific as to which tissues uh, it affects. I'm not exactly sure on that last part, but yeah, TSCs are tied to prions. One more piece of evidence um, that prions cause TSC is, is that they actually did it in a lab uh, with mice. So there's a figure in your book. I just wrote down experimental data, and I'll just talk about the diagram, and then I'm going to move on to viroids, and then we'll be done with viruses for today. OK, so here's the experimental evidence. Um, it says, for the hypothesis, uh, they have this PRP protein, which stands for a normal prion protein. So if mice do not have the normal prion protein, then it is immune to TSC infection. And if they have the normal prion protein, then it's disease causing. So when they took out the PRP protein deletion gene in mice, they lived, and they lived normal lives, and their brain appeared normal. But when they didn't take out the gene that they had injected into them, then the controlled mouse die. And so they're like, okay, it's a PRP protein that's causing these TSE infections. So. Okay, final slide, viroids. So in plants, we don't call them prions. We call them viroids. So they're inf infectious RNA. I guess I'm supposed to say infectious, maybe. I'm not exactly sorry. Sorry for the typos. Um, RNA with no protein coat. So they're just these tiny little naked molecules because they're not enclosed in a capsid. Um, and it's RNA, and they just infect plants. And so we just recently had an outbreak of a type of viroid that affected coconut palms in the Philippines. But there's a lot of viruses that, um, plant viruses. So cauliflower mosaic viruses, bean mosaic viruses, my pumpkin patch this year was infected with the mosaic virus. They looked like they had a bunch of warts on them. So when you see warty pumpkins, that is a mosaic virus that was spread by aphids. So I'm going to get those aphids next year. And go out. Yeah, you, so, because, I mean, obviously I want to, like, sell them to people. So um, I'm going to spray them with, like, soapy water, um, like, every week 
our soul, and that's supposed to keep the aphids off them. It's supposed to be a natural way. Because I mean, I don't really want to spread chemicals. I got a, I got a daughter that runs around in that garden, so pretty soon a little boy. So you know. But yeah, so there's viroids. Oh, eep. review questions. The infectious substance of prions is. Proteins, prion, that pronacious, infectious, something, something, other. Number two, blank are small naked fragments of RNA that infect plant cells. Viroids. Viroids. All right, so that's viruses. 